asked what a category was, and I said something about lists. So tonight what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and do, I guess I'm going to assume that we know what a category is, but I might remind you in a minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and, and I guess build for you a simple functional programming language in the way that maybe a category theorist might think about what you're doing when you program functionally. And what, what I'm going to do is, uh, so I guess probably this is all entirely first order. So I don't have any higher order functions in this functional programming language, but we'll at least have enough at the end to write some programs, although I probably won't write any programs for you. Um, I'm going to do it in a slightly strange way because we're going to do it consciously so that we never use variables. And I'll explain why that is a bit later on, or maybe I won't. Uh, so the first thing is, if you remember what a category was, we probably wrote something like curly C was a category. And we said that the category had two kinds of things sitting inside it. It had objects, and it had arrows. And we generally drew, I guess we wrote A and B for our objects. And we wrote things like f and g for our arrows. And we kind of think of a and b as being types in our programming language. And we think of the arrow here as being some kind of term, some kind of program that takes an input of type a and produces an output of type b. And then we said that uh, one of the important things about a category is that if I'm given two functions, f and g, that match up in the middle here in the right way, then I can compose the two of them together, and their composite is called f composed with g. Um, and I guess that uh, if we're category theorists, we just think of composition as being some kind of primitive operation that we're given. If you're given two functions, you can apply that operation to it as long as they match up, and it gives you a third function. And we're not necessarily very specific about what that third function is at the moment. That kind of emerges as we think more about our categories. So we have categories. We've got the objects and the arrows. And we tend to draw things in this way. Except for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to change the way that we're going to draw our arrows. So in the category over there, I, or in the diagram over there, I drew my arrow like this. But for the purposes of what I'm going to do for the rest of the evening, I'm going to draw my arrows like this. Okay, so there's some kind of strange ge geometric change here. So notice in this picture here, I probably would think of, if I was to draw this, if I was to get rid of the letters, then I might draw A and B as points, and I might draw the arrow as a line between those points with, with a little head on it just to show what direction I'm going in. And so I might think of the objects as being zero-dimensional, they're just points, and I might think of the arrows as being one-dimensional, they're lines. And what I've actually done here is I've, is I've switched that around. So now my objects have actually become lines. They're, or maybe you might like to think of them as wires. They carry signals on them. And my function here has actually become a point. So the way that, again, if we wanted to get rid of all the letters here, we might just draw this like, like that. OK, so, so I've kind of swapped over the role of points and lines here. So, so in the old days, our arrows were drawn as lines, they're now drawn as points, and vice versa. And there's a very good reason for doing that. It will emerge as we sort of play around with our functional program. Uh, it turns out that, that while this is a sort of nice notation for thinking about what an arrow is, that if you actually want to make calculations and understand how arrows work together and compose together, the best way to do it is to draw it this way. And we'll see some reasons for that in a minute. OK, so that's, that's the first thing. We're going to change our notation. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop for you a functional programming language that works entirely in terms of diagrams like that. So we may never actually write any real code at all, although everything that we do tonight, there is a corresponding piece of code to it. So we can write down, we can write every program or every sort of fragment that I talk about tonight as an actual piece of code in symbols. Okay. So the first thing is, how would we, if we're given a picture like this, how would we denote things like composition? So clearly, if we're going to compose two arrows together, what we would do is we'd just simply draw 
the first arrow like that, and then we're connected up to the second arrow like that. So, so we think of this, so if F and G are some basic arrows you've given me, then I think of this picture as being a picture of the arrow that's obtained by composing G after F. So this is what I called over on that other board, G composed with F. Okay, and I guess we could think about, well, if I've got a couple of arrows like this, we could also ask ourselves the question, what if I was given a third arrow? F, G, H, down here. And we might ask, how might we interpret a picture like this? Now, I guess that what I could have done here, if I wanted to say, I mean, maybe what I could have done to make things a bit clearer is I could have put a kind of dotted box around here and said that before the operation of doing composition, we had this separate thing F and this thing G. And then somehow the dotted box smashes them together. And now I think of the whole of this dotted box as being called G composed with F. So if I look at this picture here, there are two ways of putting dotted boxes in to understand how I can get the composite of these three things in this way. I could put the dotted box, first of all, at the top here to form G composed with F. And then I could put a second dotted box out on the outside here. And the kind of symbolic notion I'd use, notation I'd use for that would be then H composed with open brackets G composed with F. So that's one way around of doing it. But of course, if I change to a different color, I could have chosen to have done that operation in a different way. So I could have chosen instead to take the dotted, take these two together first, and then take this. And as you might not, you may not be surprised to hear that what that means, if I do this dotted box first and then the outer one, is that that corresponds to H composed with G, then composed with F. So in other words, composing these two things together and then pre-composing by F. So as we might expect from functional, from our experience in functional programming, what we'd hope is that either way we did this, either way we put the dotted boxes into this picture, we should get the same answer, we should get the same function. Because after all, we're thinking of this as just simply, I mean, we feed a value in on this channel, F does something to it, another value gets fed out, it gets fed in on the channel for G and so forth. And so therefore we'd hope that there's only one way for the data to go from the top to the bottom, we should get the same answer either way we compose things. And we know that that's the kind of rule that we expect for function composition in Haskell. It's kind of one of those things that we, that we learn about quite early on. So, I guess the tale of that is that we kind of just want to get rid of all of this dotted rubbish because that's just hanging around to illustrate a point. In fact, either way I do this, I get the same answer, so I might as well get rid of that and be non-specific about whether I'm going to do these two first and then that one the other way around. So there's already something about the geometry that fits in with the way that we think about composition, that, that it doesn't matter which way we break this composition of three things up into composites of pairs of things, we get the same answer. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's composition in this kind of, in this kind of picture. And I guess that before I go on, I should say that the kinds of things that I'm drawing here are known in the trade, I won't do it in red, are known in the trade as string diagrams. Or maybe we might call them, I guess if we were being more computer science we might call them process networks or something. There's all sorts of names for them. But I'm going to use the name string diagram. And it'll become clear as we talk a bit more about these things why they're called string diagrams because, well, they'll start looking more and more like big balls of string. Okay, so that's the first thing. So we've got, we've got this kind of composition. Now, in fact, if we're doing, if we're building our functional language, there are kind of two ways that we might want to compose functions. We've got, we've got this kind of function composition here. But of course, in Haskell, we also know that we can take, uh, we can take product types. 
Okay, so we can do something like I can take a type um, A and I can take a type B and I can form the product type A comma B. And I guess if I had functions that went f from A to A dashed and I had G that went from B to B dashed, then I might, we might recall that I can build a function that goes from A comma B, in other words, the product type A crossed with B, and I can build a function that we might call for sake of argument F comma G, which goes into A dashed comma B dashed. Okay, so that's another kind of composition. I guess maybe you might think of this as, as so I'll do a sort of think bubble, I guess. If we were thinking about something like Joe Camel or something, we might think of this as parallel composition. Somehow A and B are the two input channels. A dashed and B dashed are the two output channels. And I'm kind of applying F to the input channel A at the same time as I'm applying uh, G to the input channel B, and I'm getting the pair of the results out at the end. Does that make sense? So I get a, an X in A and a Y in B, and I apply F to X and G to B. I get something out of here. Okay. So this is a kind of common thing that we and that we certainly do in Haskell all the time. We want to work with pairs of values. So the question is, if I had that kind of situation, how would I draw that in terms of string diagrams? And in fact, again, it turns out that that's very easy to do because all we do is rather than drawing my uh, arrows, sort of a signal's fed in here and then the output comes out here and I feed the next signal in here, I actually draw it as a parallel composition. So I actually draw it as F composed in parallel with G. Okay, so this, and I guess that maybe I should lab label these things up. So to be consistent with what's on the board over here, that the object here is called little a, and the object here is called little b, and this is a dashed, and this is b dashed. So somehow, if I put functions next to each other in this notation, what it means is do this kind of tupling operation here. Okay. Um, and I guess I could do sort of complicated interleavings of these kinds of things. So I could have three functions composed on this line here and two functions composed on this line here, maybe another one here, and I could kind of stack them together and I'd get some kind of complicated composite. Okay, the principal thing is that we need to think about how we might interpret these diagrams and usually the way that we do it, do it is to sort of say, well, things are going on in slices somehow. So if I take a slice here, I'm slicing through the line marked A, the line marked B, and if I put the line marked A and B together, they're two objects, and that really means take the product type of those two things. So this is the product of A and B. And then if I do the line here, and I look at where it cuts those, that, that I've got A dashed and B dashed. So really this line here sliced through my diagram corresponds to the product of A dashed and B dashed. And then somehow, I guess if I've got a line that captures the two of them like that, this kind of now I'm not slicing through one of the lines, I'm slicing through these two points. And that slice corresponds to this thing that I called F comma G over here. Okay. Um, so something that's worth, I mean, I guess, so we looked at the diagram here and we said, well, there are some common, there's, there's a sort of obvious thing that we can derive from this diagram here, which is something about the fact that either way I compose these functions together, I get the same answer. Well, I can kind of think about this diagram here as well, and I can ask a kind of geometric question about it. So the geometric question is, what happened if I pushed this function up a little bit? So that rather than having both of these two things on the same level, I actually had, I'll go back to blue, I actually had this f on one level, and, uh, and I had the g down here on another level. Okay. So the question is, 
I mean, this had this composite here meant, or this sort of diagram here meant the thing that I wrote over there, just pairing F and G together. Okay. This thing probably means something slightly different. Because if I think about what happens when I start doing this slicing thing, I can slice through here, and I've captured an A and an A dashed. I can slice through here. Now I've captured F on one side, but I've still got B here. Sorry, this is A and B. So this is F here and B there. And then if I slice through here, well, now I've actually got, so this, this thing here is marked A dashed. This is marked B and B dashed. So now I've actually got on this, this is A dashed and that's B. So somehow those have got paired together in the middle. And then I've got G and an A dashed here. And then finally I get out at the end. So, I mean, there are more sort of interesting transitions going on here. And if I wanted to write these out in some kind of notation, I might use, so how many people are familiar with something like arrows in Haskell? Okay, so in, in the sort of arrow notation, what we have is we have, you can take a function and you can say I'd like to do, I can't remember which it is, is it left or is it uh, first? I think it's probably first. So you can take a function and you can say I'd like to first this function, which basically kind of adds an extra variable on, on the right-hand side, of the, it's kind of conceptually or on the right-hand side. Or you can do second and it adds a sort of dummy variable on the, on the other side. Well, in fact, that's exactly what's going on in this picture here. So if we wanted to write this down algebraically, what we'd actually say is that this is first of f, because f is sort of sitting on the left-hand side here. And I guess what we're thinking of is that as our data values come down these channels, the first one gets transformed, but nothing happens to the second one. And that's really what the first combinator in the arrows notation says. It says, you know, I'm going to do the f in the first component, but I'm not going to change what the value of the second component is. And then, of course, this thing here is second of g. So this composite going down here, probably the notation, if we were writing it down in some kind of functional programming language, would be we'd have uh, second of g. And I guess probably what I should do is I should label the second with the type of the string that's going down here, because maybe I'm not doing fully polymorphic programming. So probably I need to put down here second sub a dashed, just to remind me that the, the type of the channel going down here is a dashed. And I want to compose that with first uh, sub b of f. That's what that picture is. So if you're used to the arrows notation and you're used to second and first as combinators, and you're used to doing this kind of thing, this is the picture for that. Yep. Yes, so that's it. That would be exactly the same thing. Yeah, so, so the point there is you could think of the identity function as being another as another blob like this. And you could express this as saying that this thing here is the identity function on A dashed, and that this thing here is the identity on B. And then you're really doing the same operation as here. Okay. The advantage of, uh, I guess, the string notation is that I don't need to think about the identities. They're kind of automatically coded up inside this kind of a notation. Uh, so, so we generally do that. Um, but of course, there's another thing I could have done with this picture, which is I could have pushed g up and f down. And then, of course, I'd get a different algebraic expression at the bottom. So if I pushed, if I pushed g up and f down, then this is still channel A and A dashed. And this is still channel B and B dashed. But now, of course, what this means, if I cut, if I do my layering of my cake here, what this actually now means is, I guess, uh, first, 
of f Uh, and I'm doing it with a B dash, so I'll do a sub B dash here of F composed with second of um, A G. Okay, so we've got two expressions. This one's different to that one, but the pictures still look very similar. Oh, by the way, I should say, if we really were doing arrows notation, then we wouldn't write this at all. What we'd write in arrows notation is we'd actually write second of a g, and then we'd do this three first of uh, b dashed f. Because, of course, category theorists compose in the other direction to functional programmers. So, so the idea is that this notation here says do this first and then do that. Whereas this notation says do this first and then do that. So it's sort of so this is the notation that happens in the arrows, but I'm going to continue doing this. It's just swapping the the order over. Okay. Now of course I guess that if we take the story that we had about if I take three arrows like this and I and I compose them in the two different ways, geometrically it looks as if I should get the same answer, and that's what I expect, then we might also say in this case that, well, actually this picture looks very much like that one and that one. All I've done is I've kind of, well, I have, I mean, one way, if you were a, an algebraic topologist or some kind of pure mathematician, then you might actually say that you've not really changed anything. What you've done is you've warped space a bit so that this has moved up and that's moved down, but actually kind of warping space shouldn't make any difference to the answers that we get. And so that would tend to indicate that this and that and that should all give us the same answer. So in particular, we would hope that, well, I will use the arrows notation, we'd hope that this were true for, for compositions. Uh, so first of B, F, uh, second A dashed G. Okay. And in fact, well, depending on what version of the sort of arrows notation, there is a there is a rule that corresponds to this. Okay, so it's an important part of. I mean, this geometry sums up a rule that in something like the arrow calculus would get written down algebraically like this, but it's entirely manifest just by looking at the pictures what should be going on. Okay. Uh, now I should say that. If we wanted to interpret these kinds of diagrams here, that we'd need to, I mean, our category will allow us to interpret diagrams that just have functions going down the page and connected by wires from one to the next. But if we want to talk about things like this, we actually had to assume that our category has extra structure. And my friend Nick, who I haven't seen in many years, said that people would panic when I said monoidal category. Um, in fact, I, I was thinking that maybe uh, the embarrassing thing is I haven't seen Nick in such a long time that probably the last time I saw him I was giving this same talk. It was just 18 years ago or something. No, may, maybe not quite that long, but quite some time ago. Okay. Uh, <coughs> it wasn't quite that long, but it was close to it, wasn't it? Uh, I definitely have more hair. <laughs> um, so, but actually, I don't think, I mean, monoidal categories aren't that difficult. I mean, what monoidal category means, well, is that I've got some way of interpreting what, what sort of putting A and B, these two strings next to each other, means. Um, now, in Haskell, we said that that meant taking the product of the two types. And if we want to do this categorically, we can actually be a bit more liberal. I mean, the product's a very special kind of thing. We'll talk about the kinds of things that it does. But we can be a bit more liberal than that. We can sort of start off with a, with a definition that doesn't quite capture all of the product and still interpret these kinds of diagrams. And so in particular, what we need is we need some kind of thing called a tensor. So a tensor is just some kind of operation that goes from the category crossed with itself to the category. So what it does 
What this really means is that for each pair of objects in C, I'm given a third object in C. And for each pair of arrows, I'm given a corresponding pair of arrows. And that somehow this does something nice to composition. Well, the thing it does is it preserves it. Okay. So in particular, that's what we're talking about here. This is doing something to objects and arrows. And, uh, and well, you won't be surprised to, to hear because you'll, you'll have all proved this for yourself or, or fiddled around with it, that if I, if I had another pair of arrows, H and K, and I, composed, and I sort of did the product together and I composed them on, that would be the same thing as composing F with H and G with K. And then, OK. Uh, so that's the first thing. We need, a, we need a, well, I guess category theorists would call this a, a functor. Or maybe even just to make it more confusing, they might call it a bifunctor because we've got two copies of C here. Um, and then we also need to have something in C, I guess, which, um, which we call I, which is just an object of C. And what I is, is it's like the empty product type, just that type that has a single element in it. OK. Um, and these two things have got to satisfy some rules. And you won't be surprised to hear that the kinds of rules I have to satisfy are things like associativity. In other words, what we want is we want that if I do A tensor uh, B tensor C, that I want that to be related to A tensor B tensor C. It should be the same. Now, if we think about this, this is equivalent to saying that this, or this is a this is a approximates to saying that there's some relationship between this product type, A producted with B comma C, and this product type, um, A, B, C. Now, what you certainly know is that these aren't the same type. They've got different elements. I mean, one of them's got things that are tupled to the right, and the other one's got things that are tupled to the left. So we certainly don't want to say that these two things are equal. But probably what we want to say is that there's some kind of nice process that goes from one side to the other and back again. So that if I go round either circuit, I get back to where I started. And what that is mathematically is a thing called an isomorphism. So there's, a, there's an isomorphism between those two types there. And there's an there should be an isomorphism between these two things here. Okay. Now, I think probably what Nick was alluding to was that there's then a problem. Because what happens? I mean, if I'm doing this kind of thing where this is just a product on something, right? so we're not doing category theory, we're just doing sets with a function on it, that, uh, like multiplication, then this would just be an equality, and that would be all that there was to it. But we've now got a definite, I mean, this is a definite isomorphism of some kind. It's chosen, it's given to us as part of the structure of this category. And we kind of need to make sure that, for instance, if I take fourfold products of things, I'm going to find that I'm going to draw a big diagram where I start off with everything bracketed to the left. I end up with everything bracketed to the right in the bottom, hang bottom side. And there are actually two different ways of going from the top left to the bottom right. I won't draw them because they're fantastically interesting. But there are, there are two ways of going around that loop. And what I'd like to say is that either way I go around that loop, I should get the same answer. So that's called a coherence condition. Okay. And again, that coherence condition holds for this product type in Haskell. Um, and I guess I probably also want to make sure that this thing works like an identity. But you get the idea. So this is kind of like, a, this is kind of like the monoid we were talking about last time, except that I've kind of, I'm now doing monoids on categories. And categories have got more structure. So I can say something a bit weaker than saying it's actually a monoid. Okay. And it turns out that if you've got a category like that, that's enough to interpret all of the pictures I've shown here. OK, so that's all you need to do this. So I can do, uh, so for those kinds of things, I can work out, I can describe what this means. I mean, I guess that here now, putting two strings next to each other is like taking the tensor of A and B. And this is like taking the tensor of G with the identity on A. And this is taking the tensor, you get the idea. So just replace wherever we use product over there, over here, with tensor. You get the same thing. Now, there are good reasons for doing this. So for instance, uh, I mean, for generalizing this, 
Uh, so for instance, some of you will have heard of things like uh, linear logic. So linear logic is intended to be a logic in which we have some kind of notion that when you accept something in on a channel, you destroy it in some sense, and it can't be reused. Um, so a good example of this might be, in, in Haskell, would be all of this stuff about the I.O. monad is about the fact that we have a token called the world, and it should only be exclusively available at any one place at any one time. And we say that that world token is used linearly, and it's actually the process of handing that token from one place to the next that ensures that uh, we sequence operations in a... Like linear types in clean. That's right, exactly like linear types in clean. Now, the thing is, for products, there are definitely some things that we can do that allow us to duplicate values coming in on a channel and to throw away values coming in on a channel. And we definitely don't want to do that for uniqueness types in clean. And so therefore, what we need to do is we need to look at a more general set of things, these kind of monoidal categories, in which that's not always possible. Okay, there's nothing in this that says that you can, so for instance, None of the structure that I've talked here about here allows you to say that uh, if I've got something, if I've got an object X, there's some kind of nice map that goes from there into X. Tensor X. Okay, I haven't asked for that. That is, that does, there is a map like that when, I'm, when this particular thing is product, because that's just the map that takes X, little X, and takes it to the tuple X comma X. But in other situations, in other kind of monoidal categories, that doesn't hold at all. And in particular, the monoidal category that models uniqueness types for clean doesn't have that, that thing going on. Okay. We might look at a few, I don't know how long I've got, but we might look at a few other examples of this kind of thing in a minute. Okay. So, so that's the first thing. Monoidal categories, that's a new concept. Um, and these string diagrams are actually designed for talking about complicated things that go on in monoidal categories. What you'll find is that we've already got a lot of structure here. We've got this tensor, we've got these isomorphisms, we've got that mysterious thing called coherence. We've got a whole bunch of other properties that just come into the fact that this is a, is a, um, is a functor, even. All of those properties, it turns out, are summed up by natural properties of these string diagrams. So if you're given a string diagram like this to represent a product in there, and you shuffle the Fs and the Gs up and down as long as, you can, as long as there aren't any reasons geometrically that you can't do that, you'll get the same composite at the end. You'll get the same function, the same program at the beginning as at the end. The geometry works for programming. Yep. taking a pair of objects and returning something in the same category C. Mm -hmm. But that means that when we, you create the product, you're creating a new object, which was basically not here before. So what does that mean about C? It's, all, it's the category of objects and all the right. we can build with those objects? So in principle, so I guess if we were thinking about, I don't know, if we were modeling some fragment of Haskell, then we might say, let's think of our types as sets. And let's think of our, our, the functions we write as functions between those sets. Now, in that category, there's already a notion of product that we could use for this, which is just taking pairs of things. Um, what, what you'll find is it's a similar thing here. So most monoidal categories arise naturally through some other description. And they'll have an operation like this. So they'll already come equipped with for each. I mean, they have a just like the set example, we didn't have to add extra things in to have, have it have products. So almost think of this as some categories just have this property of having a, a tensor on it already. So that's one way of thinking about it. On the other hand, what you said there is also quite apposite to this whole story because you can think of a process of starting with a category that doesn't have anything like this and then saying, how could I stick something like that on it in the, I guess, the least invasive way? And the way you'll do that is to do exactly the kind of construction that you're saying there, which is, you know, start with the objects of the category and then say, I'm also going to throw in objects that look like A tensor B in some formal sense. And then I'm going to throw in objects that look like pairs of, of and so forth. And that's a kind of syntactic process for building a monoidal category that kind of closely mirrors the process of, of 
are, I mean, the syntactic descriptions that we talk about when we write programs, actually, is really, I mean, you can actually describe the syntax side of a programming language as being some kind of, we say, freely generated monoidal category built up in that way from some basic symbols that we happen to have in our language in the first place. So that's a very good intuition. Um, okay, so we've got all of that stuff. And I guess if we wanted to, I mean, we're going to do functional programs. So the first thing in my language is, my language is not going to be written, well, I'm going to write some expressions like this, but my language is all going to be written in terms of these pictures. I'm going to do all of my functional programming, if we ever get around to writing a program, in these pictures. And we're going to be able to interpret, interpret those pictures in a suitable monoidal category with some extra structure that we'll, we'll add on as we go along. So I guess the first thing is that actually, for my functional programming language for tonight, I would like, um, really, I'd like the, the tensor to be product, or something closely related to product. Um, and in fact, the way that we do that for the purposes of, of this evening is we'll just assume that, that our sort of basic language of diagrams also comes equipped with a couple of basic, uh, I guess, arrows that we can use uh, to write programs with. So the first one is that I'd like to assume that we had an arrow like this. Okay, now notice first of all that I've got something that's got a single string coming into it, and I've got two strings coming out of the bottom, and I've labeled the string here x, and the string coming out of the bottom, they're both labeled x. So they all really represent the same string. And so th this picture, which is a little bit more complicated than just a single input in the top and a single output at the bottom, it's perfectly admissible, but the way that we think of this is it's a, is it's a map from x into x tensor x, called, called in this, and I've labeled it delta here. Okay. Um, I've labeled it delta because this is often called the diagonal, and delta is the Greek letter for D, I guess. So, um, Now, this kind of thing will always be there if you're working with products rather than some kind of more gen rather than uniqueness types. And, uh, because we'd, we think of this as just being the thing that takes x to x comma x. Okay? So that's the first picture that we want. And then the second sort of primitive arrow that we have that we can use as we build pictures up, is I want a thing called, hmm, I'm going to use exclamation mark. And that, I mean, so exclamation mark is used for uniqueness typing in, in um, clean. Um, this doesn't mean uniqueness typing here, but it does mean unique. So often mathematicians use the exclamation mark to mean unique, and that's why it's used in uniqueness typing. Um, and this, so what does that picture there mean? OK, well now, I've got a single thing coming in the top, and I've got nothing coming out of the bottom. There's no, there's, no, there's no string coming out of the bottom of this. And the way that I interpret having no string here, this should be like that, uh, well, this should be, the way that I interpret this is kind of implicitly, no, I won't do that. I'll draw it in a different color. This is that unit object that we called i. So somehow that's a kind of interesting thing. The absence of a line is interpreted as being this special object i. Or if you like, if we were doing this in Haskell, again, this would be just that, that, uh, that type that only has a single element in it. Okay. And what this is, is that, as you know, there's a function out of any type in Haskell into that null type, or whatever it is, because it just takes every element of the input type and just, just sends it to that unique element of the output type. So there's always, for every x, there's an arrow called exclamation mark. Okay. And for us, these are the most important aspects, certainly for tonight, of this notion of a product as differentiated from other kinds of monoidal structures in our categories. So if we had a programming language that wants to model 
products as the, the main mode of parallel composition rather than something more general like in uniqueness typing, we really should have these two operations in our basic language. Okay. And there are some interesting things about these. So these things, I, I mean, I guess what we're really doing, as I say, this is entirely variable free functional programming. So I'm not mentioning variables here, I'm just labeling things with types. But this thing here really is intended to mean that if I've got a variable here, I can duplicate the value and I can use it in two different places. Okay? So in uniqueness typing, I can't do that. I can't take this value and use it in place A inside my function and a separate place in, in place B. I need to use it once and once only. This operation here means that I can duplicate a variable as many times as I like and reuse its value over and over again. And this thing here says, well, if I've got a variable, I can just discard it. Whereas in uniqueness typing, I can't do that. So if I didn't have these two operations, I couldn't duplicate the values in variables and I couldn't throw values away. Which may be useful for some purposes, but probably not so useful for us tonight. Uh, not re I mean, the monomorphism restriction is there for another. That's, a, that's to do with its polymorphic type system rather than this, than this particular thing here. Um, as I say, everything here is entirely monomorphically typed. So, okay. I mean, we can do more complicated things, but the category theory then gets a lot more hairy. Um, so the one thing I wanted to say about these two things is that these actually satisfy some quite reasonable relationships between them. Okay, so one of them is that if I start with something and I duplicate it, and then I take the second duplicate and I duplicate it again, I get a picture like that. But of course what I could do is I could do this, duplicate, and I could then duplicate the first value. And what I want to impose is that those two possibilities of duplication give me the same thing. After all, it, if I duplicate something, it doesn't matter which one of the duplicates I duplicate a second time, I'm still going to get three values that are the same. Okay? And this thing also has a nice rule that it satisfies, which is that if I, if I duplicate something and then I throw one of the duplicates away, well, that's the same thing as doing nothing. That looks like that. And that should be the same thing as doing this. Okay. So the idea is that what these operations allow me to do, I mean, what that wires allow me to do is to pipe values from one place in my program to another. That's why I don't need variables, because I'm going to draw lines to say where values are going to go from one place to another. And what these things allow me to do is to take values that are flowing down uh, channels and duplicate them or throw them away. And that's pretty much all we do with variables, those three things. Well, th there are quite a lot of subtleties about variables, but we don't need them tonight. We'll make do with those things. OK, um, something that I did put down, I've got to page one, by the way. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. It's, it's, only the top, it's only the top seven pages that I actually have anything to do with this talk. OK. Um, I just wanted to quickly draw you a bit of a picture, um, which I quite like. So we, we can actually redraw this picture slightly. If we were physicists, we might redraw this picture this way. So rather than writing that thing I call delta, so rather than doing my strings as lines, maybe what I'll do is I'll draw them as sort of tubes. Okay. So I've got a tube, and, uh, and I'm going to draw a tube like that. And then, of course, what I could do is I could be a plumber, and I could split this tube up into two pieces and draw a terrible diagram like this. Uh, now, this is generally known as the pair of pants, because this is, this is this bit here, and these are the two things. And of course, the idea is, that I feed my values in here, and they get split into two bits down here. And I, so I've duplicated the value by doing that. Okay, And then this thing here, the exclamation mark, I can draw just as a, as a sort of pocket. 
This one doesn't work quite so well because kind of if I keep shoving things in there, they're just going to fill up the pocket. But the idea is that they just kind of disappear at the end. Okay. And then of course, if I draw a picture like, well, I'm not going to draw. I'm not going to draw this one because it's just going to take me a long time. But we'll draw one of those identity rules. So the identity rule says, if I take a pair of pants like this, and I seal up uh, one leg by putting one of those things on it, then I could just shrink this thing up, because I've sewed up the bottom of my trousers here. And so I could shrink that up. Think of my trousers made out of rubber until they just seal up here, and all I've got is a straight one-legged trouser. So this is just, just that. Okay, so those axioms actually come also if we wanted to expand our geometry. So we were doing this in three-dimensional geometry and things. These pictures also come from natural geometric considerations, but we're just going to assume that those axioms hold. The reason that this has something to do with what physicists do. I mean, quite seriously, although this is a slightly trite explanation of the physics, which I don't really understand. Um, but uh, I mean, this is what physicists, this is the sort of found the basic idea in what physicists call string theory. Now, the idea is that, ra that particles, rather than being points, they're actually little loops of string. So in other words, they're things like that. And those loops of string kind of go through time. And they, they, they carry out, I guess, in that process, they describe a thing called a world line. OK, if we've got a particle, it is actually a line. If you think, sort of take snapshots of where the particle is at various times, and then join those snapshots together, and you get a line. Well, if your thing's a, a loop rather than a point, then rather than a line, you get a world tube. Uh, or, well, you may get a world sheet, but in this case, because we've got loops, we're getting a world. Um, there are also things called brains, which are. But that, that's another story entirely. Sorry? We're take over the that's right, they are. Uh, OK, so, uh, um, so the idea is that this is, these things are the world lines of some loops representing our particles. And this is a process where a particle maybe disintegrates into two other particles. Now, the important point for physicists is that if we do this picture here, or probably more important if we turn the picture up and we think about, because time can flow in either direction, as everybody knows. And so therefore, we could think of it instead reading our pictures from the bottom to the top as two particles coming together and colliding. For physicists, there's a bit of a problem at this collision point because as two things get closer and closer together, the gravitational force between them gets greater and greater. And in fact, if they actually ever get to the same point in space, the gravitational force gets infinite. And so in all of your equations, you get nasty great big infinite things. And then what physicists did before about 1970 was they then just went, oh, well, I'll just adjust all of my equations to try and get rid of these things. Uh, since 1980, they've tried to use things like string theory to do this in a, in a more reasonable way. And the idea is that in these kinds of pictures, uh, there is no singularity, because the two loops don't ever actually exist in the same point in space. They just coalesce together in some kind of more reasonable way. So you can kind of, well, that's the trite explanation. I mean, that's essentially the explanation. It's a lot harder to get the theory working. Anyway, so there is some kind of relationship here. OK. Uh, actually, no, we're on page three. No, we've gone past page three. OK, so what other kinds of things might we want to have in our little calculus for writing functional programs? So we've done duplicating things. We've done throwing things away. Yeah. You're way ahead of me. That is indeed the next thing that we're going to do. So <coughs> I do need to swap things. So if I've got a variable, if I've got a value of type x, and I've got a value of type y, then I'd certainly like to swap over their order. And be able to write them in the direction. So we know that we've got this switch operation in Haskell that's very easy to define. Well, this is going to be a primitive thing in our language. So this is called switch. 
And again, so when we introduced these things here, we had some algebraic rules. There's maybe some others that I haven't written down. Again, which I can get from looking at the pictures. And this thing here is going to also need to satisfy some algebraic rules as well. So the first thing is if you do a switch and then a switch, you should get back to where you started from. So that corresponds to saying that this picture is the same thing as that picture. Okay? And then the second important rule for us is <coughs> that, uh, well, so I thought I heard somebody say Reitermeister moves. Cool. So this, is, so this isn't, technically speaking, a Reitermeister move. No. Uh, no, it is. Yes, I guess so. The problem is, if, so, if I wanted to draw this as a piece of knot theory, I'd have to say which string was going under and which was going over. So if I do that, then the problem is that both of these are going, uh, yeah, both of these are going under like that, right? So this is actually the double twist, which doesn't pull out to this, but it's basically, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Well, no, I would... That's right. Well, so in this particular case, well, for product, this rule holds, okay? The other rule that we want is def definitely does look like the, I guess, the famous, the most famous Reitermeister move that says something like this. If I have three inputs and I swap the two first two inputs over, so this is x, this is y, and this is z, and then I swap the th last two inputs over, and then finally I swap the first, the, what's now the first two inputs over again. Okay, terrible diagram, but this is now z, this is now y, and this is x. And the other way of doing this would be to start with x, y, <coughs> z. Now swap these two over first. Swap that over. And then, then do that. So this is now z. Y, X. And I think you'll agree that although these are quite different pictures, that we would hope that we get the same answer if we flowed uh, our input data values down through this picture as that one. And so therefore, we actually want to say that those two things are the same. Now, I could write down for you a long symbolic thing that explains. We've got a switch function, and I could use, I mean, this thing is left <coughs> Z of switch. This thing is right y of switch, and this is left x, left x of switch. Okay, so if we were writing this again in the arrows notation, we'd write it as those three things, and then we'd have to say that that was equal to whatever this means. Uh, right, uh, right x of switch, left uh, y of switch, and so forth. Okay, and again, you'll find that uh, well, almost this kind of thing happens in the arrows notation. There's, a, there's an extra, so I decided tonight I wasn't going to talk about arrows themselves. There's an extra twist to arrows that makes some of these things a little bit more difficult, but this is basically the same idea. So, I, so what I could do, so if I was writing my programming language, I'd say my programming language has a thing called delta. Maybe that's called duplicate. It has a thing called discard. It has a thing called switch. And then I just insist that those things satisfy these equations that we've been talking about. And that's the kind of thing we do in the arrows notation. We say we're going to have these primitive operations, and they're going to satisfy these algebraic equations. My well, point is, again, I'm doing, these are the kinds of rules that we naturally need to have to handle variables. I mean, what our variables are doing when, we work, when we're using them in our programs is they're allowing us to pipe values from one place to the other in a relatively implicit way kind of disappears here and appears there. But I can rewrite any process like that in terms of duplicate, switch, switch, and throw away any kind of process, any kind of, basically I can draw these diagrams with strings and I can take your values from anywhere in your program to anywhere else. Okay, and it turns out that there's a theorem, which is, which category theorists would call a coherence theorem that says that if, it sort of says, Here's a sufficient set of 
combinators and equations between them in order to get this correspondence between the pictures we're drawing and the... So there is actually a math... So there's essentially a mathematical theorem that says that, for instance, the arrow combinators are enough for doing this kind of diagrammatic reasoning. Okay. Yes, that's right. Although sometimes we do also want to bracket the tensor product, but I'm going to try and avoid that tonight. Um, I mean, we could, we could try explicitly to introduce some notion of, I mean, sealing wires together. So, so I could label, there's no reason why I shouldn't label a wire X tensor Y. But then there's the question, how does that relate to just sticking X next to Y? And really, they're the same thing. For some purposes, we might want to have this. But then we have to have some notion of going between this representation and that representation. So then people introduce extra things that do things like you know, have notations like this, where I've got a little thing there. And this goes x, y. And then this would be x tensor y. And then we could. But I'm, I'm kind of trying to avoid this notation tonight because it's a little bit difficult to interpret this because all the other things that we've done involve some kind of activity. They're actually doing things. I have to do some work programmatically to do a switch. This isn't actually doing any work at all. It's just a notational convention. It's just sort of saying that two wires stuck together like this are the same thing as a wire with this particular label on it. Okay. Um, now, again, as we did over here, I mean, we said we could dispense with these axioms if we wanted to do uniqueness typing. It's also possible, although I haven't seen people do it, that we might want to dispense with this axiom here. I mean, it's a very common thing to do in, um, in mathematics, is to dispense with this axiom here. And just to have this axiom and that axiom. And then what we have is we get a thing called a braided monoidal category. So rather than doing a switch and then a switch giving me the, same, giving me the identity, a switch followed by a switch is actually something else. It's not the identity at all. And the algebra of these things is then the algebra of knots. And one could imagine that you might want to build a functional programming language that built the algebra of knots into it. I'm not quite sure why you would, but uh, that's something you might want to think about. OK, so, so we've got a functional programming language. I can take values from one place to another. So I don't need any, any variables. I just use strings. I can compose things together both in parallel and horizontally. I can write a whole bunch of programs. Okay, so if you give me enough sort of basic primitive things, so maybe I need to have some basic functions that do things like give me some integers. So maybe, maybe we need to have something called n. Okay, and that's just a, again, that's a built-in function that takes nothing in and returns me the integer n. Okay. And then maybe I might also want to s insist that you give me some primitive functions like plus, which takes a, an n and an n and gives me an n. OK? And so then I could write the program that said add the number 3 to, to the input by just drawing. So here's the program in this notation that's add the number 3 to whatever the input is. OK? And I can pretty much, I mean, as, as in any, we're writing any programming language compiler, we've got to have some built-in primitives. So all of these basic functions that we give ourselves are just built-in primitives with some assumed axioms. Um, the important thing is that the things that we've talked about, about switch and, uh, and so forth, they're the things that allow us to pipe values from one place to the other and handle variable type things. However, there's one thing missing from this as a general purpose programming language. Can anybody imagine what it is? Looping. Looping. Absolutely. Have you heard this talk before? Mm -hmm. Since I haven't given it in 15 years, uh, you haven't heard it from me. But uh, yes, absolutely. So the one thing that we haven't got is looping. Uh, and kind of. So in this story that I'm telling tonight, this is actually the only bit of the story that I have made any contribution to. Whoops. Uh, 
OK. So the question is, how do we handle looping? Now, let's think. Looping is about feedback. And it's essentially about I take the output of something, I feed it back in the input, and I keep going. So, so let's think. Suppose I had a function f like this. And it's got an input value. So it's got an input. It's going to input an x and a y. But I'm also going to have an input u and an output u. So suppose I've got a function. So this notation really means I'm taking in a value on the x channel and a value on the u channel. And I'm returning a value on the y channel and one on the u channel at the same time. So I guess this is a function from x tensor u to y tensor u, or if we're happier with products, x product with u, y product with u. So it's some kind of, I guess, as I say, this, none of this is higher order programming. So everything is, is uncurried. So everything, all functions take in tuples and return tuples. OK, so suppose I've got something like this. Then I can imagine that I could feed the output u back into the input. And I could draw a picture like this. Now, I've been very careful. I mean, in all of these diagrams here, I keep on forgetting the arrows. I think when I first started drawing them, I drew some arrows on the strings pointing downwards to show the flow was downwards. Um, and I conveniently forgot about them, basically because all of my strings had arrows pointing downwards. But in this thing here, as we might expect from feedback, I've now finally got a kind of thing that's going up in the other direction. So I need to put my arrows back on so that we know which direction things are going in. Now, the important thing is that this is, this is going to be an operation. OK, so there's no sense in which we have sort of strings that do go up the page. You can kind of think of this as some kind of primitive operation that we just draw. We imagine in our mind's eye that it looks like that. It's really just an operation that takes something from x cross u to y cross u and gives me a new thing from x to y. And I guess we might call that new thing from x to y uh, fix sub u of f. OK, and it's called fix. Well, maybe I shouldn't call it fix because it's not quite fix. But I guess what I'm thinking of in the back of my mind is we have this thing in Haskell called fix, which goes from uh, u to u to u, which is the fixed point combinator. So it takes a function from u to u, iterates it, and then possibly returns me a u. Well, in this language, well, this isn't quite fix. But I am doing, I'm doing some kind of looping thing on the u. So maybe what I should call, well, I'll call this what I, what it's generally called. Uh, I'm going to call this a thing called a trace. Use TR for that. Now the reason it's called a trace is because when, I guess, many years ago when I was, when I had more hair, uh, some colleagues and I wrote a paper called Traced Monoidal Categories. And the thing that we were thinking about here wasn't iteration at all. The thing that we were thinking about here was taking the trace of a matrix. So if you take a trace of a matrix, matrix is just a big grid of numbers, n by n. The trace of the matrix is the sum of all the values down the leading diagonal. And it turns out that while that sounds like a very boring operation, it's very important in all sorts of things, including physics. And the idea was that what we wanted to do was generalize the notion of trace so that we could talk about the kinds of things that people wanted to do in physics. Uh, and it turns out that this operation here, this feedback operation, if we think of f as being a matrix of some, some sort, I don't know why we can think of it as being a matrix of some sort, that's another story, then this is really the process of taking the trace. Okay, and what we were doing was we were writing down the formal kind of I, I, on the one side, the geometry, and on the other side, the formal equations that this trace operation conforms to. It happened that at the time, we had a chap visiting us who knew something about computers, actually knew quite a lot about computers, 
And he pointed out that uh, this trace thing was also, not only was the operation we were talking about uh, suitable for talking about traces of matrices and generalizations thereof, but it also captured the important aspects of what it meant to iterate something. And in fact, that's where this, that's where this stuff gets. So this stuff gets used, this stuff on traces gets used nowadays not only in functional programming, so you'll find that the fix IO operator essentially comes from this notion of trace, but it also gets used very heavily nowadays in the theory of quantum computation. So uh, if you want to essentially feed the outputs of your quantum computer back into the inputs, you use a trace. Now, the interesting thing about quantum computation is that the operation here is most definitely not product. Because in quantum computation, we don't work in the category of sets and functions or some, some relative thereof. We actually work in the set of, we work in the category of things called Hilbert spaces, which is where we do quantum mechanics. And it turns out that the corresponding product for Hilbert spaces is not, is not the Cartesian product. It doesn't, it doesn't work at all that way. It doesn't have a, a diagonal. You can't, if you've, got t if you've got a particle in a quantum state, you can't duplicate that to produce two particles in the same quantum state. So, I guess we might ask ourselves, if we were going to write our functional programming language, what kinds of rules would this thing satisfy? And it turns out that, again, we can do the same thing that we've done for the other things, and we can have a look at some of the geometry. And I'll draw some of the rules, and you might want to go back to look at something like the rules that the fixed point combinator. Hello. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll come back to explaining that in a minute. Yeah. Um, so there's a bit of a roundabout way of explaining what that is. Uh, I mean, one way of interpreting this would be think about if you were thinking of these as synchronous circuits and you were thinking of this as sort of actually literally feed, so just sort of synchronous circuits where you have values every time tick and you actually think literally that this is the process of feeding this, the output of this synchronous circuit back into itself um, with a delay. Um, and then I guess the value that gets emitted on here uh, eventually is going to be whatever the, uh, but um, I mean again it's kind of imprecise at this level. Uh, but we'll get a bit more precise in a minute. Um, So actually, the rules that we know must hold for the fixed I.O. combinator come from thinking about these kinds of pictures and then encoding them up into algebra. So the kinds of things that, uh, that the kinds of rules that this thing satisfy, as I say, all come from the geometry. So, so for instance, suppose we had an F here, and it's got an input there and there, uh, X and Y, and we've got U, and now this time I've got a V here and a V output there. Then there are two ways that I can, I can, uh, I can kind of do a trace, one of these feedback loop operations on here. The first way would be I'll feed V back into itself, which gives me a function. I mean, that now becomes a function from um, X U to Y U, okay, because I mean, the thing that I've omitted to point out is that when I, feed, when I feed U back into here, it disappears. I can't, it doesn't appear directly on the output. Okay. Um, so I can feed, and then I can feed back U in there. So I guess if we were, if we were using the trace notation, this TR thing, we'd say that this is TR of U applied to TR of V applied to F. So we do this one first, then we do that one. Okay? And I guess the other thing that we could do is we could think of, I mean, after all, this is just U tensor V. So we could use that peculiar notation we wrote here and say, well, rather than, I want to save myself some time. So rather than doing two separate feedback operations, I do a single feedback operation of a pair of values. Okay. That would probably look something like this. 
And essentially, I guess the only reason that I've drawn it like this is just to make the point that I'm doing a single feedback operation on a pair of values. But I guess if I was not to use these things, then I'd just have basically exactly the same picture as I have on the left. So, so you'd expect these two sides of things to be the same. This thing over here, however, has the name trace uh, u tensor v of f. And so therefore, I'd want those two things to be the same. And this rule is called something or other. Uh, can't remember. Uh, which, can't remember what that's called. I'm sure we had some really snazzy name for it. Okay, so that's the first kind of rule. So all of the rules for these things come from looking at the geometry of the situation. Um, so I guess maybe, what did we call this? We probably called this vanishing for some strange reason. In fact, what we called this was binary vanishing. Which kind of doesn't really make sense unless you see what nullary vanishing looks like. So I'll show you nullary vanishing. So nullary vanishing is the situation where I start with just an f that has a single input and a single output. And then, of course, I can put a string next to it called u. OK, just that's a, that's a left f, right? And then I could do a trace on this. So I get something like that with my, OK? And what nullary vanishing says is that, well, this is just a pointless circuit. And so I can vanish it away. So that, that just becomes this. OK? So those are the two forms of vanishing. I don't know what other. Um, so there's a bunch of other rules that, I mean, they all come from just looking at some of the basic geometry of these things and saying, what would I expect from the geometry of this kind of operation relative to all the other things we've talked about so far? And we get a bunch of rules that are called. Um, things like, well, we've got vanishing, we've got a thing called tightening, so there's a lower and upper tightening rule, so that says, so I guess that that says something about if I do, so I'll just do tightening and then, and then we'll stop looking at these rules in detail. So this says something like, suppose I've got an F here, and it's got an input like that, an output like that, and then I feed into a G, okay, and then I do a feedback. So think of this as a, suppose I've got a, an output like that. This makes a reasonable composite. I've got, this has got two inputs, it's got two outputs. I then just feed its first output through G, and I get a sort of line like this. Well, I can do a, I can do a loop up like that. And the idea is, for tightening, is, well, what happens if I tighten this loop so that this rows above G? Then what I'd get is I get something that looked like this. So in other words, it says, if I've got a situation like this, where actually G is just, is just going to end up doing something on the output, um, then I don't need to include it in the actual iterative step. I can, I can contract the iteration up just to handle F, and then apply G just once at the end. Okay. Um, so this, that's why it's called tightening, because I tighten the loop up. And there's one that works also if G's on the input, I can tighten the loop down. So there's tightening. Uh, there's a thing called yanking, which gets rid of if I've got a cross. So if I've got a pair of wires crossing and I loop them around here, then you might expect that you could yank them out and just get a straight line. Um, and uh, what else have we got? Uh, well, superposition. And so it turns out that there's five or six of these things that are basic geometric operations. And you can prove a theorem that says that from just those five or six basic geometric op operations, you can get all of the other geometric operations you might expect by sliding things around and pulling wires out and, and stretching things up and down. And I mean, basically, sort of all of the geometric operations you might want to have. Yep. Find the, the null, nullary vanishing a little bit surprising. Just thinking of your, uh, what you were saying before about the traces and matrices. Uh -huh. uh, so the 
Uh, I think it's. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess we have to get the operations right. So, um, uh, what am I doing? What did I say? I got the wrong definition of trace, didn't I? Did I say this? I can't remember oh. that part of it. Uh -huh. um, did we actually say that um, just because f is some type of matrix, that a naked wire is equivalent to an identity matrix? Uh, did we ever say that? Or does that have to be explicit? It may have to be explicit. I don't remember now. Let me see how that loop corresponds to a matrix. Can you find a matrix in that Sorry. Okay, so, so I guess the first thing is what are we doing? So in the matrix example, I guess, oh, okay, so how's your math? In the matrix example, we think of X and U as being vector spaces. And this thing is direct sum of vector spaces. Uh, and so we're going from there to there. Uh, so what are we doing for the trace? We're taking the... Uh, okay, so F looks like a matrix. Uh, so maybe the best thing to do is I'll I'll answer the question afterwards. It's probably the best thing to do. In the Haskell case, yeah. Because in the Haskell <coughs> case, your unit forming your monoidal structure would units appear. Uh -huh. You wouldn't need matrices. That would be like numbers. Yeah. But then we could yeah. take it like from source to box path and then turn it into a matrix. Uh. Yeah, I mean, what I'll do, as I say, we, I'll, I'll, by the time I get to the end of the talk, I'll have remembered what that is. Um, okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> where are we? Five or six operations. Just okay, so five or six op, and, and there's a theorem that that uh, that that demonstrates this, and it's the. It's essentially the same theorem that justifies the, well, not quite the rules in, the, as I say, the arrow calculus is complicated by the fact that I actually had to add into my diagram an extra thing called a control line just to make sure that I can't move uh, operations that are, I can't move imperative operations past each other in such a way that they're going to, to muck things up. So I can't move a put after, I can't start with a put in front of a get and move the put round the other side of the get, essentially. Uh, but modulo that, the kinds of axioms that you find in the fix operation in the arrow fix situation all come from these kinds of, of geometric considerations. Um, so the question, I guess, is I haven't actually told you why this operation that looks a little bit abstract, aside from the fact that I said, oh, well, this kind of curls back on itself and that looks like iteration of some sort I'm feeding an input into uh, an output into an input. I haven't actually told you why this has anything to do with the fixed point combinator that we're used to. And the best way to demonstrate that is just to think, is just to do a calculation, I guess, with some of these diagrams. So So let's think about what the I guess, what a sort of general, so in fact, in this situation, I guess, the kind of fixed point combinator I, I'm going to, to tell you a bit about is something that maybe we might draw as, uh, I've got a U here and a U there, and I've got a V here, so I, no, I've got a V here, okay, and I might draw it as, as kind of this, so, I've actually, I'm actually sort of joining these two, um, I guess. I'm actually 
feeding the definite output here back into the input rather than having a separate output. This is actually a thing called a Conway uh, fixed point operator, I think, after John Conway. Um, now, we don't have this kind of an operation, but we actually can get it from two of the operations we've already seen. So what we do is we take, so this is the function f, we take the function f, u, v. It's got a single output v. Now, if we just feed that up into here, we're going to lose it in our trace operation. We're going to get no output at the end. So what we do is we duplicate it. Okay, so I duplicate the output value and I feed it one side of that back into the input there. Okay, so this is kind of, I guess, forget about the I, this first. So it turns out that in these things, because I'm doing first order functional programming rather than higher order functional programming, I need to have this extra control input here because I can't kind of lambda it away. Um, but forget about that. This operation here looks like the fix operation because it's taking a function from v to v, it's iterating it, and it's producing a v out at the end. Okay, so that that should, if I forget about the u, or I just make it the, I just make it this. Uh, well, I can just erase it entirely because I could make that the identity, the the empty string coming in. Um, then what we'd call this, I mean, this just looks like fix. Um, u to u to u. It the operation takes a function from, sorry, v to v to v, but it doesn't matter. It takes a function from v to v, it iterates it and returns a value of type v. So let's see why this operation might at all look like a fixed point operator. Now the important point about the fixed point operation is that it should have the following, um, I mean really the thing that comes back to your question about how is this going to at all be any kind of iteration, how do I think about this, is to think about what kind of rule this kind of fixed point operation has in Haskell. Okay, and if we draw that, it says something like, well, if we draw it, if we write it, it says something like fix, so what does it say? It says f of fix of f equals fix of f. Okay. So what that means in terms of this Conway operator here is, well, I've got to have this extra control line because, as I say, we're not doing higher order programming. So I've got U. Um, so this says if I, so let's draw this thing here first. Um, so fix of F looks like that with F in here. Okay, and then I want to feed the output of this into an f, which is, uh, which is going to go into the second variable of the f, like that. And then I guess the question is, what am I going to do with the u? Well, I'm going to feed the same value in as I fed into the first copy, because that's, that's got to be shared between all iterates. So the thing that I've got to put up here is this delta thing. So I copy the input. I pass one into the iterated version of f, and then I add a, I pass the other one into the f down here. Now, of course, that's, that's our picture using this kind of fixed point operator of f fix f. And we want that to just be equal to fix f. So in other words, it should just be equal to this picture. Okay. And we're fairly happy that once we've got that property, then we know that this is a, this is just like the fixed point combinator in Haskell. And we know that we can, I mean, we can basically use exactly the same technique as we do in Haskell to get us, uh, you know, we take an auxiliary function and we, we apply this to it. So the question is, how can I show that this thing here has that property? Um, and the answer is that, and this is really the end of the talk, So I haven't actually written you any functional programs, but never mind. Uh, so the answer is 
that we can take that picture here and we can substitute it in for, these, for this thing here and then we can see what the geometry looks like to us. So, uh, let's see, what do I do? Of course I can't see from over here. I think maybe, does anybody mind if I rub this off so I can actually see what I've written on the board here? I'll just get rid of that. So I guess what I want to do is I want to start with, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to start from this side and I'm going to try and show you that it's the same thing as the thing on this side. So I start with something like this. Okay, and it's got... So that's, that's how we define our fixed point operator in terms of the trace. And then what I want to do, well, let's think. So I haven't written down all of the equations for this delta, but it seems reasonable that if I do f, which for the purposes of this language is just a pure function, it doesn't have any side effects. So if I do f and I feed it into delta, that should be the same thing as duplicating both of these inputs and feeding the duplicated inputs into two copies of f. So in fact, this thing looks just the same thing as taking a u in and taking a v in like that. Then I guess I've got to do something like swap these two over. I've got to swap my variables. And then I'm going to feed my f I feed those into f and f, and then f, those both have a thing coming out of here, and only this one is going to get fed back up into there. Okay, so that's the first thing. So I'm just pushing this, so as I say, it's, this is a pure function, so it doesn't matter if I do the duplication before or after, I get the same thing. Then the second step is, oh god, what is the second step? Uh, okay, so the second step is that it's actually possible, using a, a thing that I didn't tell you about, which is sliding, to slide this all the way around that loop. Okay, so it's just, I take this and slide it all the way around. And what I get by doing that is, I guess, rather than having this, I have a, a double loop going all the way around here. And then in here, I've now got the delta. So that's just sliding the delta around the loop. Does that make sense? And then finally, I guess, so this is the bit that is a little bit hard to visualize, but it actually turns out that I've also got enough, as I said, sort of almost anything you can do on the plane I can do with my axioms. So if you think about it, if you take this bit here, you can kind of flop it over the F and run it straight down in through there and then pull this f down. Right. Does that make sense? So I'm just taking the whole of this loop and flopping it over. It turns out that's another rule in my calculus. So if I do that, it means that I'm rubbing out the whole of this. And in essence, what I'm doing is I'm doing something like this, except again, this really can't go up here. And the way that I can prevent it from going up geometrically is just pulling the F down. So when, by the time I've pulled the F down here, I get that picture, which I hope you'll agree is just this. Okay? So the, I guess the lesson is that actually, so if you read things about things like the fixed point combinator and so forth, when they're doing it in algebraic form, you get these sort of screeds of algebraic equations and you get lots and lots of equalities and stuff. Secretly behind those, what people are doing is they're drawing pictures like this. 
to convince themselves of what the argument should be. They're shifting strings around because there is this theorem that says that you can do that in certain ways that preserve this equational equality as long as I have those axioms holding. And then what they do is after they, I mean, then what they do is they say to themselves, these pictures are hard to typeset. What's more, if I was to do, I mean, that operation we did there was very simple geometrically. If I was to write it out in the steps, there's about seven or eight steps in that, each of which is a big picture. So by the time I've done those in all of my papers, my papers become 80 pages long, which actually isn't rare for me, but never mind. Um, but the, the important thing is that it's entirely the geometric reasoning here that drives the equations that go into these things and that allow us to make some quite nice calculations about the way things work in this situation. Um, so I guess the exercise is, uh, given what we've done here, I mean, I wouldn't do the exercise, but given what we've done here, write a program as one of these pictures to do, I don't know, take an input, and so take a, take a number n and sum the numbers from 1 up to n together. And you can draw that. It's not a particularly large picture using the operations that we've built up tonight. And I think that's... Uh, all I really wanted to say. Oh, I have actually got to the end this time. Questions? Other than Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Um, oh, the only other thing I meant to say was that you have seen variable free functional programming before. Uh, so I guess the first variable free functional programming language was the was the Curry's original combinator calculus. Uh, and you can all go away and write programs in that because the language unlambda is an implementation of that. And there again, you have some basic combinators that allow you, rather than having explicit variables, allow you to pipe values from one part of your program to the other using these kinds of operations.